I think the one unique thing that separates him uh, from a lot of superheroes is that he's a man. He's not a super force from another planet. Green lasers don't shoot out of his fingers. And he's traumatized from his youth, and it's certainly a fundamental fear you're going to lose your parents. He's raised by someone else who's lonely and angry and... There's a goodness in him. He wants, he wants to right wrongs. And he has all the vulnerabilities and all of the flaws and all of the human drama that any human being has. He's not perfect and he's not impenetrable. He's uh, a man, not a superman. It's a perfect character. It's a perfect story. I, I wanted to add mythic qualities to our story of Batman. And so there is a struggle for Bruce Wayne to find his identity in so far as why he ever became Batman. To look back in his past as a child and the events that happened to him and why he became Batman. He has a choice as a man now whether to continue to be Batman or not. Why does a man do this? It's as if he's cursed to pay some great penance. Now what crime could he have committed to deserve a life of nightly torture? It's more than just professional interest, isn't it, Jason? Val Kilmer was to me a much more mysterious and romantic and coolly aloof Bruce Wayne. Very different than Michael Keaton. Although they're Batmans in the costume with the voice doing the stunts, was pretty much the same. You look at Val Kilmer and you think, what the hell is that guy thinking? Because certain actors have that thing where you look at them and you know the wheels are turning in there. Val Kilmer felt more haunted but heroic. Well, also, yeah. Val Kilmer, he's rich. Yeah. He walked into a room and you realize this guy's a billionaire and people are attracted to him. Yeah, he was, he was comfortable with his wealth, where Michael Keaton's interpretation was he was never comfortable in his, in his own skin right. and never comfortable with all of this stuff, which had basically come from his parents. Right. I killed them. What did you say? He killed them. Two-Face. He slaughtered that boy's parents. No. No, you said I. I killed him. The things that are most fantastical about Bruce Wayne have to do with basic American dream ideals. He's disgustingly wealthy. He's so wealthy it never comes up. What he chooses to do with his free time is, is fight an impossible battle against the crime of a city that's corrupt. It's very wild, very radical, very political. This is a guy who, who can't just take off the mask and the cape and put it away. It's going to creep into his everyday life. It's going to be causing repercussions in his everyday life. And we wanted to explore those. You have a thing for bats? Oh, well, that's a Rorschach, Mr. Wayne. An ink blot. People see what they want. I think the question would be, do you have a thing for bats? It's a classic character now, and people are still uh, enthralled with it. It's kind of become, especially with Val stepping into the shoes now, it becomes even more classic because you have Michael Keaton, Val Kilmer, and then who knows who else will, who will play the role. So it seems to be almost like a James Bond, but a different kind. Batman's all about doing and action. These incidental things that come up where he's got to stop and talk to people. He'd rather not. And I, I like those scenes a lot. He likes Chase, but why'd you call me here? And just wants to go. It's a, it's a really good screenplay. The sadness is that this man who can never be healed, right. if he was, it would be a terrible thing for the city. It would be a loss for the city if he was healed. So he sort of needs to maintain his, uh, his psychological problems for the sake of everybody else. And I think deep down he has to know that. About 11 months after the first story was published in 1940, Robin was introduced, the first of the kid sidekicks ever. Over the years, over the decades, the legend has been that of Batman and Robin. 
And I think no matter how they're portrayed in the movies or the comics, from time to time, Batman will be alone. From time to time, they'll be together. But I think there's no way they'll ever permanently be separated out. And in the comics, in fact, there have now been several Robins who have been created to fill the role. What that allows you to do is to sort of get to Nightwing, um, who is the adult Robin character. And in fact, that is the costume that Chris wears in the movie. Who's your tailor? I took the liberty, sir. I, I was fascinated doing the, the movie just to kind of see what the story is like. Where did Robin come from? So what we did was we went back to the comic books and just started reading every version of Robin's origin story to say, you know what, let's at least honor the history that already exists. The legend of Dick Grayson in Batman comics is that he and his family, they are traveling acrobats with a circus. I brought in Dick Grayson, who becomes Robin, because his family has also been killed by a criminal. And he's a mirror of what happened to Bruce Wayne when he was younger, so he gets to relive that through another person. His parents died, and he's consumed with revenge. He can't think about anything else. There's fun to this truth that we find one way or another situations that force us to work through those things we haven't worked through from our own life. Whenever you go out tonight, I'll be watching. And wherever Batman goes, I'm going to be right beside him. I mean, how are you going to stop me? I can stop you. <clears throat> I think Chris O'Donnell did a great job as Robin. He brought believability to the character. If the character in the movie had been 12 years old, as he was in the comic books when he started out, the believability factor, that suspension of disbelief, would have been strained really I think to the edge, but Chris doing it the way he did at his age was able to scale that and make it work. I was excited that it was the right, I was in the right place at the right time. I, mean, I suppose if they had done Robin in the first one, it wouldn't have been me and I wouldn't have been a part of it. Not just a friend, a partner. aren't rodents, Dr. Meridian. Really? I didn't know that. You are interesting. And call me Chase. She's a criminal psychologist. She's just moved to Gotham City. And that's how she first encounters Batman and he knocks her off her feet. I mean, she's sort of attracted to the, the dark side of life, so... Batman is, is very attractive to her. Bruce Wayne is uh, interested in, in her, so therefore there's a, a love triangle between two people, obviously. Chase is fun. She's smart as Bruce, sexy as Bruce. I, I said, can we, we, it's, it's not going to be believable. I mean, she's a psychologist. You just don't dress like this as a psychologist. Joel says, Nicole, this is a comic book. We throw logic out the window. It is heightened reality. And then as soon as he said that to me, I understood and we went with it. And it was the red lipstick, the perfect hair, the deep gravelly voice. But when you got that blonde hair, you got to have a deep voice. I want to be close, but you won't let me near. What are you protecting me from? She's got a very straight job. She works inside the police headquarters. But uh, as soon as she meets Batman, she's flagging him down off of a local rooftop. I'll bring the wine. You bring your scarred psyche. You know, we've never seen in a Batman movie anybody use the bat signal except Commissioner Gordon. So one has to admire the determination of such a beautiful young woman that she would just turn on the bat light so she could meet Batman. Finally, her arc is, you know, where she starts to explore her relationship with Bruce as well as her relationship with Batman, which are both completely different even though it's the same person. Don't work too late. Riddler's uh, origin and his personality to a degree always seems to change from every interpretation. He basically is 
Edward Nigma from the comic books on to uh, you know the movies and animation, but they've always done a little bit of tweaking here and there to kind of make the character a little more current or give him more of a connection to Batman. The casting of Jim Carrey as the Riddler after his performance in The Mask and a lot of stuff he had been doing on uh, In Living Color, he could really become that kind of rubber-bodied character wearing the spandex running around with the question marks all over him. Jim Carrey's performance as the Riddler was truly one of the great performances I've seen of a comic book villain. I think he took the elements of the comic book. There was what Frank Gorshin had brilliantly done in the TV series and made something really quite unique out of it. That's not gonna be good for me. I need an answer now. I think I deserve it. I'm sorry, Ed, then the answer is no. We had the license to basically decide for the first time how the Riddler became the Riddler. So that was like this, this privilege, like, oh, nobody else has done this. We get to define it. I thought the idea that he was somebody who worked uh, for Bruce Wayne yet was vastly unappreciated and held back, not necessarily by Wayne himself, but by the corporate system, was uh, a very interesting way to go. He's quite brilliant in his field. He ends up getting fired, and so it's kind of revenge, but he also has a, a desire for Bruce Wayne's approval, and it kind of drives him a little crazy. <laughs> you were supposed to understand. You see in Jim's eyes, you see the change, the, the flip over, okay, I love this man, now I hate him. I'm now your enemy. I'll make you understand. And it's a beautifully played moment by Jim. Just he, beautiful. He nailed it exactly, yeah. exactly as, as we imagined it. Yeah. He's a sycophant, you know? He's like this stalker almost. And he's, he's completely obsessed with Bruce Wayne. He, he, he loves the guy, <clears throat> you know, slash hates him. It's about seeing somebody who is the guy that you'd love to be and resenting him for it, you know? And that's how it basically, you know, snowballs into this sick fantasy. This is your brain on the box. <laughs> This is my brain on the box. Does anybody else feel like a fried egg? So he's sucking Gotham's brainwaves. He's, he's devouring people's IQ. And so he just becomes a mega intellect, although he's mad, you know. So, I mean, intellect with madness is kind of kind of a fun combination. Like the jacket? It keeps me safe when I'm jogging at night. He's not a very physical guy, except for he's very flamboyant. Trick! He's got a little touch of Fred Astaire, a panache, a, a joie de vivre. But uh, he's not gonna hurt anybody with his fists, but he'll pick up a rock. That's where you have to be careful. It's just a great character because it's, it just takes on different forms and he gets so full of energy and evil power that you know you just can't help but love playing that it's just it's just amazing he rehearses and and practices harder than anybody i've ever known and when he comes to do the scene it's all spontaneous but within parameters that he's really worked out his facial expressions his body movements how he uses the cane how he uses his face he's extraordinarily professional you know, it's not who has the answers, it's who knows the questions. Harvey Dent was his name before he fell into uh, villainy, and he was a district attorney in Gotham. And he was, uh, he actually had a rather good working relationship with uh, the Batman. And when Boss Maroney, who is the sort of, you know, mafia don of Gotham City, threw acid in Harvey Dent's face and turned him into a psychotic, schizophrenic, he became a criminal. He is a uh, torn and interesting character because he was once a friend of Bruce Wayne's and was once a crusading district attorney and had so much good in him that to see him horribly scarred and really driven insane really brings a whole layer to his character development. It's someone who has a close connection with Bruce Wayne 
and someone who, based on the fact that he wants to see justice done in Gotham City, will allow Batman you know, uh, kind of a blind eye to operate. And then when he's scarred, it's like, you know, this bitter payback, you know, like I, I allowed you to operate in the city. I, uh, you know, I looked the other way and, and, now, and now look what's happened to me as a result of this. Okay, now I'm your worst nightmare. Became everything that he shouldn't have been. And ultimately, Batman could have went down that road too. He could have went to the excessive vigilante side where he became just as bad as the criminals he fought, but he chose to hold himself back. Harvey did not. Nothing better than live bait to trap a bat. There's the wild card aspect of Two-Face, the flipping of the coin to decide whether or not he's going to do good or evil. That's something else that's wildly divergent and it's a wonderful plot tool for characters in, in storytelling because you, you don't know how the, the coin flip is going to turn out and how it's going to affect how the story is being told. I was a great fan of the comic book as a child. Harvey Two-Face appeared in 1943. I was born in 46. In, in the sort of narrow, narrowly specialized uh, area of Harvey Two-Face, I, I became a Bob Kane scholar and spoke to Bob about Harvey's background and, and did a good deal of research. I mean, of course, Harvey is all about duality, you know. Having said that, we now have a firm grasp of the obvious, and that's really all that's required. <laughs> yeah.